Wonderful. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, again, we'll continue to encourage people to add to the already great list of questions in Slido that we will get to after the next and final talk for this session, which will be uh, from Sarah Teichman, who is the head of cellular genetics of the Sanger Institute and also co-chair of the Human Cell Atlas. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Jonna. Um, can you hear me and see the slide well? Looks great. Thank you. So um, what I'm going to talk about in the next 10 minutes is um, viral entry into infected cells or into predicted viral entry and then viral entry in infected cells. Um, but first of all, what I'd like to do is give a short introduction to the Human Cell Atlas Consortium, just in a couple of slides to remind you that this is an initiative to create a comprehensive reference map of all the cells and tissues in our body. And the vision was that this is this basic science project would have implications for understanding disease. And what I hope to show you in the next few minutes is that um, you know we, we've gone quite a long way to achieving that in the context of COVID-19, I think. So the Human Cell Atlas um, at technologies or, or the are really at the heart of the project and what sort of catalyzed the project. And they are the ability, uh, they, they include the ability to do genomics at the level of a single cell. In other words, the resolution revolution in genomics that's taken us from bulk genomics and the consideration of ensembles of hundreds or thousands of cells to the ability to do genomics in single cells. And it's the single cell genomics coupled with spatial methods, either imaging or sequencing, that, that are allowing us to, to reconstruct tissues at single cell resolution in this project. And that's the aim. The aim of the project is basically to create that high resolution map of the human body. And in terms of the single cell genomics, at least, this gives you an idea of where we stand at the present time in terms of the numbers of suspension cells that have been profiled at the transcriptomic level for these different uh, tissues. And this is just one snapshot of a few of the, the major organs and systems that the community is, is uh, studying. So, so kidney <clears throat> that we'll hear about later in this uh, session today, um, in this meeting, the liver, skin, and the airways, uh, as well as gut and development. And so um, it's particularly the airways um, that was one of the, the communities that kind of catalyzed this work. And um, it was in the wake of COVID-19 and the need to basically communicate very rapidly across the human cell atlas community that, that we formed so-called biological networks. And what these are are communities of people that are uh, focused on specific biological tissues, organ systems, and the, the airways is one of them. So the lung cell atlas biological network was formed kind of as a rapid way of coordinating all the work on the lung. And, and there are four coordinators, um, Martina Wayne, uh, Sasha Misharn, Pascal Barbri, and Raj Rajagopal. And you can go to humancellatlas.org slash coordinators and see the coordinators, not only of the Lung Cell Atlas Network, but also of all the other networks that we have in our community now. And this is, I should say, this is a growing effort and we invite everyone to, to join um, to, to join the HCA community, humancellatlas.org slash join HCA, or to write to coordinators if you're interested in specific tissues. So what I want to focus on today is how that healthy reference data that I just alluded to can help us inform our understanding of COVID-19. And it's already been shown earlier in the session, the mechanism for the virus to enter cells is primarily through the ACE2 um, angiotensin converting enzyme that's on the cell surface. And then proteases like Tempras2 and others downstream um, that cleave the virus. And so early on, this is back in, in February, we went back to our own data um, in uh, focusing on the lung and, and, and placenta and so on, just to check where ACE2 is expressed in these tissues and to, tr to try to use that to predict where the virus might be entering and how it might be getting transmitted from one person to another or indeed from mother to fetus in a, in a vertical sense. And um, this was work that uh, um, was spearheaded by Ward on Sungnak, a postdoc in my lab, and Ni Huang, uh, a bioinformatic staff member who worked with him closely and uh, uh, coordinated across the entire community that chipped in in an amazing way and pulled together. And um, what we did was not only uh, um, analyze our own data that I've mentioned, um, you know, lung, placenta, et cetera, 
but also the community contributed unpublished data in a really unprecedented and generous way in terms of the counts of ACE2, TEMPRS2 and the other proteases in, in unpublished tissues. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And you can see the different uh, tissues that were, were included here. Um, and what I'm gonna focus on is, is uh, barrier tissues specifically, um, at, because their, um, my, our thinking was that the healthy reference data would be most informative about viral entry. Because as we've heard, the cytokine storm and the chemokines and cytokines that kind of follow um, can have a big impact during the pathology of the disease as, disease as it progresses. But basically, if you're considering the very early stages of infection, then that healthy reference is probably the most informative. And so if we start with levels of airways, and we had studied the nose using nasal scrapings, the, the, um, the large generations, the third, the sixth generation of the bronchi in the lung, um, and then the parenchyma, the alveoli, and that's shown on the left-hand side, and then I'll get onto the other tissues um, 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 next. And so what we saw in the nose was that there were, we, we described ciliated cells, but also two interesting populations of goblet cells uh, in, a, in a paper in Nature Medicine last year, where one of them had a more kind of immune signaling inflammatory phenotype. And it turned out that that goblet cell population also had a, a really high expression of ACE2. And so that led us to predict that these cells which are shown in dark blue could be the, the, the cells in the nasal epithelium that get infected. Um, and I'm just sort of summarizing things very, very crudely here. Um, in the, the bronchi, we've got ciliated and club cell populations that are high in ACE2, and then the parenchyma, it's the alveolar type 2 cell that's been known already for SARS-CoV-1 to be uh, a cell that has the ACE2 receptor um, and, and that gets infected as shown by um, uh, colleagues in the Netherlands in a Journal of Pathology paper. In, 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 and and um, if we look at other tissues besides the airways that could be entry sites for transmission and could explain the high transmissibility of the virus, then if we, if we consider the eye, um, Linda Lako's group contributed this in an incredibly generous manner um, from, from uh, up in Manchester and they, uh, up in Newcastle, and they, um, what that revealed was that there are superficial conjunctival cells and corneal epithelial superficial jet cells that have um, expression of ACE2 in the proteases, and um, and it's it's specifically those those conjunctival cells uh, that could explain the the um, the viral conjunctivitis that's that's observed in in some uh, COVID nineteen patients, and that could explain and implicate the um, nasal lacrimal tract for, for uh, transmission of the disease. In the, in the gut, there are uh, best four enterocytes that are high in ACE2 um, that could explain the, the diarrhea and um, implicate the, the oral fecal route of transmission. And then the placenta, so the last barrier tissue that I'd like to consider, um, we found some interesting cell types that had ACE2 in the proteases, and those were perivascular cells, so pericytes, um, and, and this has made me think, you know, uh, with all the, the discussions about the vasculature, whether it's actually parasites rather than endothelial cells in other tissues that may also be getting infected potentially. And then um, trophoblasts on the, the placental side of the maternal fetal interface. So this is from uh, predictions from data from first trimester uh, placenta deciduous tissue, the maternal fetal interface. Uh, and, and then the, 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 I guess the question from this work is, are these cells that we, that we predict as potentially having the gateway for the virus to enter inside them, um, are they actually getting infected? And the, the only way we can really validate that or find out about that is by uh, studying patient samples. And of course, the uh, HCA community is, is uh, you know, doing that now both in Sanger in the UK and the US and Europe and so on. Um, there are a lot of studies of uh, mainly blood, but also other tissues, uh, including the, the air, including airway samples through nasal scrapings uh, and tracheal washes and, um, and post-mortem tissues. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about that work in, in a lot of detail, um, uh, uh, but what I do want to mention is work by Kirsten Meyer, who works with me, and Marco Nicolich at University College London. And again, this is knee 
Quan and Christoph Polanski, who did the computational analysis here to, to um, quantify the number of viral reads in single cells from nasal scrapings of COVID-19 patients. And um, what I'd like to highlight is that it's those secretory cell populations, so the, the, the goblet cell types that I mentioned earlier on the nose that have high reads, um, um, but there are also ciliated cell populations that do have viral reads. Um, but what this, my point here is simply that uh, these are exactly the cells that we predict to have the ACE2 receptor, and this is, this is sort of showing that those predictions um, could indeed be informative, at least in terms of this preliminary unpublished data. It's very early days. This is all data that's coming out, and we're analyzing it as we speak. What Wardon and Need did in, in um, this paper that came out in April in Nature Medicine that, 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 I'm, that I was talking about earlier is um, to also look for, for genes that are correlated with ACE2 and co-express, so are there uh, in the healthy reference nasal cells. And um, the, what you can see in, in orange down here are cells that are uh, part of the, the innate immune response, basically the you know, cell autonomous, ubiquitous innate immunity in epithelial cells. Now, Ben asked me the other day whether we see interference themselves. No, we don't, but these are related genes of the innate immune pathway that are coming up. I wanna point you towards the COVID-19 cellatlist.org resource where we um, deposit all of this data and people are really generously uh, also adding new data sets, both for healthy reference and we now have a, a, a patient part of the portal. And I just wanna very quickly, I've acknowledged most people I wanna mention Martina Wayne and the other coordinators of the lung network who really helped to coordinate everything, Pascal, and, and I've mentioned the others. And I also want to mention, so I've mentioned Linda Lako, but also the other people who generously contributed unpublished data. I've mentioned Markham Nikolic and, and, and Karsten. This was really quite an amazing experience how people pulled together in the pandemic. Just two minutes for me to mention unpublished work on the oral cavity. So the oral cavity was one element that hasn't been uh, wasn't considered in that early COVID-19 cell atlas work, but uh, Blake Warner from NIH and Kevin Bird from UNC um, have both been doing independently different biopsies of the oral cavity from uh, healthy donors. And what that data, uh, uh, which Ni nee has been analyzing um, for, for human and also for, for mouse, shows that there are cell populations in the tongue and the salivary glands that have high ACE2. Now, what, what Blake has done with Paula Paris in his lab is go to post-mortem tissue and do staining for the virus and the ACE2. And indeed, we can see that as, as same as for the nose, in the mouth, those predicted structures in the salivary glands and the ducts and the asini are, have uh, the virus is entering and into, into those specific cell populations. So I do think that our predictions of viral entry are, are being validated in many different tissues. And it's really important to understand that the mechanisms of, of um, the, the cells that are infected uh, for, for, you know, the, the, in the nose, in the, in the oral cavity, in terms of understanding the early phases of infection transmission and perhaps also blocking, like Ben mentioned. Um, and, and obviously for, di for understanding um, what, uh, for, for diagnostics in terms of salivary diagnostics and so on that we're moving to now. And, and without further ado, I will thank you and, um, we, I think we can move to the Q&A now. Is that right, Jonah?